Cape Cod is an inspiration for innovation. E-Steamers will introduce you to the often overlooked entrepreneurs who are building Cape Cod's future with steam. Join us on the journey as we discover the makers, the innovators, educators, and artists who are creating the new economy on the sandbar. Welcome to E-Steamers. I'm your host today, Paula Hersey, and we're talking bzzz, bees beekeeping as a science, as technology, as engineering, as art, and math. With me today is the president of the Barnstable County Beekeepers Association, Calliope Egloff. Hey, welcome, Paula. Calliope. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. How's the bees doing? Uh, my bees are doing really well. I uh, had a bunch of overwintered hives, which is always nice, yeah. and um, I've been hearing good things from other folks in the association. How are your bees doing? My bees are <laughs> doing pretty good. I have to thank the, the Barnstable County's uh, Beekeeper Association for uh, getting me started. Your class that uh, runs uh, from January. January to May was invaluable in actually getting up and running as a beekeeper. Um, and I guess I didn't realize uh, how much science, technology, engineering, art, and math go into beekeeping. Uh, we'll talk a little bit today about the entrepreneur piece of beekeeping as well, but let's start with some of the science. Uh, I got a package of bees, literally a <laughs> box of bees with a queen in her own little box. Mm -hmm. um, I think I got 3,000 or so bees? Maybe 10,000. Maybe 10,000 bees by the end of the summer. How many bees am I gonna have? Um, right now it should be peaking at about 60,000 bees in your hive if your queen is actively laying and you have a nice solid hive. Um, yeah, so it swells up from like, I think a package is 10 or 12,000 bees depending, um, which is a little bit different than a nuke. Some, right. some folks start off with a nuke, a nucleus colony. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you should be around 60,000 bees right about now. That's just crazy. <laughs> and then if they do overwinter, what will happen is they'll grow even to a bigger amount of that and I'll have to split those into a new hive. You could split them, certainly. Yeah. Um, people choose to do that. It, your hive that's overwintered is going to be stronger in more ways than numbers. You're going to have a more genetically solid hive in the sense that your, um, your bees have overwintered. They're going to become more acclimatized acclimatized yeah. to, their, to um, our Cape Cod winters, so yeah. they're going to be a little bit more strong in that sense. Um, they're going to know where the nectar sources are, so they're going to be able to forage for food and, um, and, and let the other, uh, the new foragers know where those are. So there's a lot of different ways that your hive will be stronger. Number-wise, yes. Right. Um, and then some people decide to split their hive, and so you can make two from one. It's literally splitting it, as you right. know. Um, and then other people um, really keep an eye on their hive to keep um, sort of manage the swarm um, sense that yeah. a, bee, um, a honeybee will have, and um, they just keep that hive um, as one hive, and then they build it up, and then the bees continue to stay just, one family so oh, interesting yeah. didn't know that i'm going to learn a lot in this show today not everyone just, no, splits not so every, yeah. not everyone splits. some people stay <laughs> yeah exactly or some bees stay <laughs> so the we'll go backwards so the math piece of this is you start off with a finite number of bees in a package mm -hmm. and it grows to a, a huge number of bees and then there's all sorts of feeding types of ratios, so there's a lot of math involved in beekeeping, correct? You can take it to another level too. Um, Dr. Thomas Seeley at Cornell uh, worked with the math department there to um, figure out the, um, when bees go to forage, um, how they geolocate, and when they do the waggle dance when they come back to their hive to inform the other honeybee foragers where the great nectar sources are. He was able to figure out with the math department at Cornell um, the the that the bees actually have a geometry um, to their ability to go out and find good forage, yeah. and so when they come back to the hive and they do the waggle dance, um, his, uh, Dr. Seely's um, group was able to um, figure out what that waggle dance meant from a geolocation perspective yeah. and then they were able to take the pollen and the nectar from the bees 
and match it to where uh, mathematically those bees said that they came from and said by doing the waggle dance right. and they were able to figure that out so you can take it to like you know one cup of sugar to one cup of water when you're making a honey syrup to like you know calculus <laughs> so it's yeah, I'll stick with the one cup one cup the calculus stuff sometimes blows my mind but, but when you're um, teaching for instance young children and I had yep. a 4-H bee club for years um, you can really keep it simple or you can get it really right. complicated, and it's really up to the beekeeper or whoever's doing the, you know, the uh, the explore, exploration of their own style where they want to take it, because you can go really in depth. That's amazing. So how about the art? Uh, people don't realize that there's an art to beekeeping. Um, we were talking a little bit before we started taping here in the show, and everybody has this individuality of uh, either recording or journaling about their hive or the, the artistry of beekeeping. Can you talk to a little bit about it? You talked about Castle Hill and some of the other uh, courses that are out there within the beekeepers. Well, I think, again, you can keep it simple. You can paint the outside of your hive. Bees don't care if there's a mermaid or a whale or a shark painted on the outside of it. Right. And you see that globally, like in, in cultures like in Slovenia, where there's more beekeepers per capita than any other place in the world, they make mosaics out of their beehive. So each hive is like a tile in a mosaic, Ooh. and they cluster them closely so you are looking at a larger picture. And then, when, like for instance, when I had my 4-H club, the kids would paint like flowers or whatever, like really appealed to them on, the, on, yeah. the, on their hive. So you could have like beauty in the field, but then there's also something that I believe in. It's maybe a, a little artsy, but it, it, beekeeping can allow you to unfold in a creative sense. There's a lot of different ways that you can express yourself through beekeeping, merely through beekeeping. Um, I, some people do the photo journalism or the, um, uh, some people um, sketch in their beekeeping journal, some people write. Um, it just, it, it invigorates the creative side and I think if you allow that to unfold you can see where beekeeping could take you. You could just beekeep. You know, right. you could be the scientist, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do my thing and I'm going to write in my right. journal the weather and the time and my bees and what I did. But then you can also sort of like loosen up a little bit and like, you know, write some poetry or write a description of the field where your bees are, or your backyard or how you feel or how you feel about bees, how you feel about the world. And then some people, like at Castle Hill, they have this great um, encaustics conference where they paint with wax. And, that fascinates uh, me. Yeah, they paint with wax. it's pretty cool. And uh, so I was thinking, like, I have bees in Provincetown, and the wax comes from the bees create the wax, as you know, from the plants and the the, the water sources um, that the, that inform the plants, almost like uh, in wine, the terroir of the wine comes from the soil and the yeah. and the the. Uh, the, the water source, um, that the wax there is different um, than it's, it's because the water is different and the plants are different in Provincetown than they are in Barnstable or, or Falmouth. And so I was thinking like if you used wax from your area to paint with, that that could be um, at another level oh, yeah. of expression to your painting. The encaustic is amazing. Not, I don't think a lot of people know about it, but it's used in religious iconography, like in Russian um, paintings and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. They would use wax because it comes from a, quote, virginal insect, and that had a lot of impact with religion. Um, yeah. And so it has like all these layers of meaning. Yeah. But people make beautiful, non-religious um, paintings with wax. And Castle Hill down in Turo, I think, is a really good example of where they um, took it to a, a global level, because people come from all over the world to practice and study and teach there. Yeah. That <laughs> that's another whole like piece of beekeeping I didn't even catch was you know painting with wax that's that's a great one let's work one letter back engineering bees are the quintessential engineers are they not I mean yeah. I am completely fascinated with my hive and the way that they have built the structure um, literally from a thin piece of what we just it's just a foundation wax. It's on a frame, and they literally build their entire colony. And they know, as soon as I put them in there, they know what they're supposed to do and how to engineer that. 
That's amazing. And that's the most controlled environment for a bee, right. a Langstroth hive, which is what you're describing. Right. You can have a top bar hive where instead of putting that foundation in, you merely have a strip of wood with a groove um, and the bees create their own comb. And it's, it, and it's beautiful. Um, sometimes it's wavy. Um, and then some people, um, if you allow um, a honeybee to um, come into your house, which is something that you obviously don't want, but it happens. A coworker of mine, her grandfather, had a farm up in Western Mass, and he had a whole wall of honey. The whole wall was honey in the farmhouse, and um, and when you see pictures of it, it's um, it's wavy along the beams. Yeah. And um, yeah, they're amazing engineers. They figure out how to make that structure. They love um, figuring out space. They're yeah. really, really spatially aware. Bees are. Um, and they build these amazing things. And then if you take it to like a kind of a more complicated level for them, from an architecture or sculpture standpoint, some artists around the world are creating like a wire frame or a frame of some kind and then allowing the bees to build the wax frame onto that structure to have that be part of a sculpture. Like they'll build um, oh, wow. like a feminine figure and then the bees yeah. will build the head. And, um, or uh -huh. it's one, there's this, um, it's a glass box and there's a mannequin inside yeah. it. And the artist gives, um, the sculpture gives the bees colored wax and the bees have built um, comb all over this mannequin that's in its bright red. Oh my goodness. So like, it's, it's, again, you can keep it simple. You can build your Langstroth hive and you can observe what your bees are doing. Right. And every once in a while you can let them make a little bit of drone right. comb or some of like, you know, burr comb, which is that sort of rogue comb if right. it's not the right space. But then other people take it to the next level. Yeah. So it's well, kind of amazing. That, that piece with the different types of um, hives. So the Langstrom, which is the traditional box, you put frames in the box and I think what fascinates me the most is the Slovenian hives. They look like little houses and they're completely different than what I'm used to in the, the Langstrom. And then the top bar hive, which I'd seen pictures of, but I hadn't actually seen in the wild or anything. I've seen a couple of Slovenian hives actually built out. They're so cool. Uh, the engineering yeah. of the Slovenian hive is just really, really cool. What I like about it, as I'm not 20, one years old anymore, right. the older I get, is um, instead of working from the top, because those boxes, as you know, when they're full of honey, can be 80, 100 pounds. Yeah. Um, I found that out last year. <laughs> it's like an awesome, heavy, um, because it's full of honey, but right. um, the Langstroth, the, uh, the Slovenian hives, you work it from the back of the hive, so you open the door, and you, so you don't have to do a lot of heavy lifting. I find that much more appealing, plus they're beautiful, yeah. and also all the bees, the beehives are, close together so they're, right. they're keeping each other warm during our cold winters you know they say you can yeah. golf year round on Cape Cod but two years ago <laughs> that was not happening and I think um, statistically almost all the bees on Cape Cod right. died that yeah. last one not last winter but the winter before so there's that nice quality to the Slovenian hives where they're able to sort of keep each other warm yeah. They're one thermonucleic uh, unit in the wintertime, yeah. the bees are, but when they're in that Slovenian method of being all abutting each other, they're able to uh, loosen up and eat, you know, move around the right. hive a little bit more uh, freely and eat, which is what they need to do. Right. And then I think that there's something comforting about the Langstroth hive because it's all very orderly. Right. You know, it's like frames one through ten and you, you number them and, and there's bee space and everything is, but the top bar hive is you take that concept of the Langstroth hive and you flip it over on its side and then you create a hive that's just one box and then the bees, it's a little bit more free form. Yep. And then the other cool thing about it is um, the bees are making their own wax. They're not using a foundation from away. Right. I don't know, China, Minnesota, right. wherever it comes from. Although you can have those foundations made from your own wax at some of the companies. but the. And then from a pesticide standpoint, um, from a, a chemical standpoint, the, the, the wax is like the, high, uh, the uh, liver of the hive. It holds all the toxins. Okay. And so when you have a Langstroth hive, you're using foundation from somewhere else that you're not in control of unless you right. make it yourself. Whereas the top bar hive, the bees are pulling the wax from their own environment. Yeah. So like my bees in Barnstable Village um, at Cape Cod Organic Farm where I'm the beekeeper, that wax comes from Cape Cod Organic Farm, um, and it's from their area. So if I made a lip balm from there, I would feel a little bit more comforted that there was a lower level of pesticide right. um, in that wax as opposed to Chinese wax. 
nothing against the Chinese, right. but I don't know what they're putting in, right. you know, what they're putting in their wax. So that kind of brings us to science and technology, which I think are going to go to together, those two letters, and the real plight of the bees. Um, don't make me cry, Paula. I'm not, I, well, <laughs> I, I lost my first hive last year. Um, it's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. It, you know, you, you grow attached to these little insects that are just so amazing to watch and, and to watch grow. Um, but science and technology, you know, as agriculture has grown and, and, and we try to, you know, uh, you know, we talk about GMOs and all these other, you know, uh, alphabet soup, basically pesticides and the bee population and the bee population itself there are issues with it and there's all sorts of things that are going on can you address as with your association hat on mm -hmm. what our state's doing what you think the state of the bees are here on the cape and in massachusetts so there's two states there's right. the commonwealth yep. and then there's the state of beekeeping um <laughs> right. so Last, not the winter we just had, but the winter before that, a great deal of bees died on Cape Cod. I think the American Bee Journal said that um, um, quite a few of the bees died across the country last year. Cape Cod parallels that number. It's a, it's a, it's a huge statistic of bees that die every year. It was around 40% is what the number I saw come out. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a little bit more than that. Um, it was closer to mm. 50. I think it was 46%. Um, and and that's like on a national average, whether that's from pesticides or um, poor management of your hive with pests um, or starvation or the cold. That's really something that's still, I think, in discussion. Here mm -hmm. on Cape Cod, um, we find that um, well, if we were asking people why their bees died, they, beekeepers can't quantify or, or qualify, rather, if they if the bees died from starvation or from the cold or uh, a pesticide application or lack of um, lack of some other like pollen or something that they needed in order to sustain, sustain themselves through the winter. I think a lot of people have a lot of opinions on why bees are dying um, and I don't think that I think it's such a loaded question that uh, governments and, and organizations are going to be really reluctant to like put a finger on a button and say this is it. I think Overall, you know, there, there's some we can like as beekeepers ourselves. What we can do keep the focus on ourselves, and what we can do as beekeepers to have fat bees going into the winter, which is so they have lots of pollen, yeah. they have a lot of honey. Um, you bring up the GMOs. Some people are having a conversation about the the syrup that we feed our bees. That's made from cane syrup. That's made from a GMO GMO product. Right. I don't know what, how that affects the digestive system, or right. you know, if some an uh, insect has such a low th tolerance for um, alteration at a genetic level. I can't speak to that. Right. Um, but we can do our best job as beekeepers in our own backyard, uh, making sure our bees are fed, they're, they're, they can overwinter by being protected from the wind, mm -hmm. um, that they have plenty of forage. And then there's things that people can do, like um, I, I hear from, from just regular people that aren't beekeepers that are extremely worried because they know that when all the bees die that humans follow thereafter. And so like that's a really scary concept and right. not everyone wants to become a beekeeper in order to sustain the bee population. Right. And um, so there are things that regular general people can do. You can like take a pause before you mow your clover. You can let your clover bloom and then mow right. it. Um, not have such a hater attitude towards dandelions. Oh, you know what? Either. Our yard was littered with them this year. And yeah. my husband, who normally we didn't, we haven't used pesticides in years, but he has this that long dandelion tool. Yeah. And that was his mission was to like you know rid the lawn of dandelions. It's one and of then the. we found it was the first food. It's the first food really of the season for bees. Right. So like instead of having this like really like sort of rigid attitude on how you want your world to look, right. I want a perfect lawn. I don't like dandelions, clover. You know, I don't want to step on a bee. It's like loosening up and relaxing a little about the way that we perceive our world. Plant some monarda or some other bee-friendly plant. But then there's also all these wild plants like um, the milkweed. Um, it, people are were trained from an early age to hate on dandelions and milkweed and all these right. things. But kind of just to kind of relax a little bit about that, I think um, that you can do that. You can buy local honey. 
Like how awesome is that? Like right. that's not hard at all, right? <laughs> right? I mean, that's available in a lot of different places around the right. Cape. Usually if you go to a farmer's market or a place like Cape Cod Beer or Cafe Chew or whatever, right. there people are selling local honey. Those, those, um, those companies are supportive of that local initiative. Yeah. Last year we did a honey drive through the association because we know that the price of honey um, is unaffordable to some people and that's just not acceptable. If you're, if you're broke on the Cape, you should be able to have some local honey. Right. And so we did a honey drive um, and we collected quite a lot of um, honey, I think it was close to like 80 to 100 pounds and we donated that to food pantries across, you know, in, on the Upper Cape. We tried to focus where veterans would mostly be, um, but this year we're going to do the f um, service center in Falmouth on right. that food um, pantry. So really trying to like open up the availability of honey right. across the demographic and the economic drivers, um, letting people know what they can do in their own backyard, really supporting beekeepers to be the best beekeeper they be, could be through education, the monthly meetings, our newsletter. And then like, you know, sort of like think, think lo global, act local, yeah. and just being the best beekeeper or the best sort of like beekeeping citizen that you can be and then letting the rest of the world unfolds like we're right. never going to control Mon the Monsantos of the world that's right. just it's not going to happen right. but we can make a difference at our on a personal level and that's what I think the real message is is like buying local honey planting some pollinator plants giving them a place to water yes 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 with the mar like the, you were talking about how you got the bowl with the marbles with the yep. water the bees love water they need water and um, they need the little marbles to stand on because they're not very good swimmers yeah they'll, they'll die, <laughs> they'll die. <laughs> so there's all these like little ways that people general people yep. can help and then there's things that beekeepers can do yep. um, I try to practice integrated pest management or IPM I right. try um, not to use chemicals when I'm beekeeping um, because that's my personal opinion on how I want a beekeeper and as you know right. you can have like 4,000 opinions in one association with right. 10 people <laughs> they're gonna like give you 17 different ways right. to do it um, but you, having your own philosophy on beekeeping and sort of standing by those principles I'm not a, yeah. a chemical person um, so I don't use but you're chemicals making product out of your 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 bee byproducts so yes. not yes. having those chemicals is really comes back to the e for e steamers is entrepreneurism you're literally thinking about retiring into a bee business yeah, so I think keeping my eyes on my prize of like always working because that's right. the model that I grew up with with right. my parents and my family is um, always you know you always vote you yeah. always volunteer and you always work right. um, and so after I'm done with my um, professional career I, I want to do something that really strokes my creativity and allows me to you know if I want to buy like a nice French wine or right. something that's not American cheese it's like you know a little <laughs> bit like you know maybe a, a fine cheddar or something I want to be able to afford it so right. um, the beekeeping kind of I feel like will help me with that so my partner in my business um, Honeypot Hives and I we try to um, look at look at the honey market and what it is that we can create to um, create a sustainable business that will allow us to like age gracefully with a little bit of extra you know yep. money That's so exciting. what do you is, we were talking earlier um, me I'm thinking okay I can sell a little bit of honey I can make a wax candle I, I'm, I'm really not that artistic except on the the photography videography side so you know the whole making stuff kind of blows my mind it's amazing <laughs> <laughs> but there's I mean those products aside those are everywhere um, every and pretty much any beekeeper can go and get the molds for the candles and melt on the wax and things like that but you're talking in your particular business some different types of products that either are ancient, were, were an ancient world product, like the honey dust, which I'd never heard of before, and then the honey pearls and caviar. Can you address some of the things that you'll be making? Sure, and I'm so grateful that there's local honey everywhere and that there's candles everywhere. I buy them for Christmas. Yep. That's all I buy really is like local products. Yep. And I love that I can go out and buy like 17 or 20 tapers of candles to give to people right. um, but what I create is and 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 so that's sort of ubiquitous with the beekeeping right. honey and candles and pollen so we, I we trap pollen we sell that and that's used in smoothies we um, sage restaurant in in Provincetown uses our, our pollen in their preparation for their foods 
Um, we create um, honey caviar and uh, pearls using molecular gastronomy. So the honey is a globe or a sphere of honey that you can add to a drink. It can hold the temperature up to 165 degrees Fahrenheit. So you could put it in a hot toddy um, in the winter time mm -hmm. if you wanted to like, you know, do the throat soothing. You could put it in a glass of champagne. It would bob up and down kind of like the old I raisin trick. <laughs> it's the old raisin <laughs> trick. Um, you could also put it on a cheese plate. It's really mm. graceful and elegant. Um, you can put it on top of a meat off the grill or out of the oven and it will hold its honey sphere shape up to, like I said, 165 mm -hmm. degrees Fahrenheit. So that's kind of fun and it's kind of interesting. It appeals to my looking forward um, and I love molecular gastronomy. Um, and uh, so we sell those and then we also sell honey dust, which is um, it's honey dust. It's made from um, cornstarch and honey and you apply it to your body and situations where you want to have it's someone a sensual treat. For <laughs> Thank <couples>. you. <laughs> Thank you for saying that so nicely. Um, yeah, and it's um, something that um, you know you often see at a bachelorette party as a present mm -hmm. to the bride, or when I was in my 20s and all my friends were getting married. That's one of the ubiquitous presents that right. we got. And um, so it's kind of exciting because everyone loves um, to give something beautiful and local and. Um, so, and then we also make wedding favors. We make like little honey bears that are two ounce honey um, with a little heart that says like, you know, meant to be or something like that, you know, oh. with the, with the uh, date and the uh, names of the wedding. Um, we also do those for party favors and all that kind of stuff. So I think you can look outside the box with beekeeping. You can, you know, you can explore your creative side very readily. And there's, I think there's myriad options of what you can do with it. And um, and those oh, yeah. are the ones that you know we we're doing right now. Who knows what we're gonna do like in 20 years? But so how can people get involved in beekeeping? What's the bee? Uh, I could tell you exactly how to get involved. <laughs> Is the Barnstable County Beekeeper Association? You are president of that organization this year. Um, give me just a two second, three second. You know how to get involved in beekeeping. Taking B school is a really good start. Okay. Uh, you get a great education, you get resources, you get a mentor, and then you can you belong to the association automatically. And there's a big right. support structure there with meetings, um, newsletter. The Facebook page is amazing. The Facebook page is amazing, um, and and I think the biggest the biggest driver is the is B school and, and those association meetings. We have right. 90 to 100 people show up at every meeting, and that's phenomenal. That's right. just I think unprecedented for a you know an educational meeting where you can like um, interact with each other. You can talk. About about what your style is, and, and, there, and there's cookies. There's um, always cookies. So that's good. Um, so that that's a nice, um, really sort of community-driven mm -hmm. educational. Um, there's also YouTube and millions of journals. And, and at, you'll be at the Barnstable County Fair this year. We'll be year. at the County Fair as usual in our honey hut. Um, we're having a beekeeper's ball on September 17th. That's open to the general public, fun for people of all ages. You don't have to be a beekeeper. Um, that's going to be at the Cultural Center, and uh, all the information is on our, that Facebook page. Okay. So there's a lot of different ways that people can get involved, but awesome. I think Bee School is the best. Be nice to bees. <laughs> right on. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much, Clive. Nice it was to see great you. talking with you. Thank you. I'm Paula Hersey, and this is E Steamers. Mm -hmm.